I'm Karen Offen. I am an affiliated scholar at Stanford University. And um, I work as a historian, and particularly historian of women and of feminisms around the world, mostly European. Uh, a couple of my books are on the back table. You can have a look. They're all available. That's enough for the commercial. <laughs> uh, the reason I am here and in this series is kind of a roundabout story. Uh, because uh, when I was unpacking some things that, of mine that were in storage, I came across an old life magazine uh, from 1964. Now, I had been a camp counselor at Perry Mansfield in 1963. Oh, wow. <laughs> and during that time, I had met Skeeter Werner, and I knew about Buddy Werner and the Werner family. And they, had, they were running the hotel downtown. And um, in 64 was when Buddy Werner was killed in the avalanche in Switzerland. This particular Life magazine that I had in my possession had a six-page spread on the avalanche and the death of Buddy Werner, wow. and a couple of pictures of old steamboat. So when I came across it, I looked at the article again. I thought, I wonder if the museum in Steamboat would like to have this. Huh. And uh, I kind of got in contact with Katie, um, who did some sleuthing, apparently, and <laughs> discovered that uh, I was uh, a scholar and might give a talk. <laughs> oh, you got to watch out. If you have anything to do with me, you might be doing a brown bag soon. And the reason we're, we're back in Steamboat now is because we have a daughter and son-in-law and two granddaughters who live here in Steamboat. So we almost always are here for the 4th of July. So it worked out very well for everyone. And uh, I want to thank you in particular for coming today. I know it's a busy weekend. I appreciate your presence. So without further ado, I'm going to be talking about Maywright Sewell today. It's probably not a name that is terribly familiar to you, but it will be by the time we're done. <laughs> but I want first to start out with a little Fourth of July celebration. Uh, one of your handouts. Uh, it was a declaration and protest of the women of the United States by the National Women Suffrage Association, July 4th, 1876. Uh, this was presented at the first big international exposition put on by the United States. And it was the beginning of a time when the, the women's movement really connected with the international exposition movement. Um, I'll just read you a little, you can uh, follow along, and there's a particular reason which I'll get to when I'm sharing this with you, not only because it's the 4th of July tomorrow. While the nation is buoyant with patriotism and all hearts are attuned to praise, it is with sorrow we come to strike the one discordant note on this 100th anniversary of our country's birth. When the subjects of kings, emperors, and czars from the old world join in our national jubilee, Shall the women of the Republic refuse to lay their hands with benedictions on the nation's head? Surveying America's expositions surpassing in magnificence those of London, Paris, and Vienna, shall we not rejoice at the success of the youngest rival among the nations of the earth? And they go on to talk about the, the great things that have happened. Um, yet we cannot forget, even in this glad hour, that while all men of every race and clime and condition have been invested with the full rights of citizenship under our hospitable flag, all women still suffer the degradation of disenfranchisement. And they go on to, to um, offer articles of impeachment, <laughs> which go on for several pages. So the writ of habeas corpus, the right of trial by a jury of one's own peers, which women cannot be tried by, Taxation without representation, wow. unequal codes for men and women, right. the advanced legislation for women. But here, this is interesting, representation for women on the third page of this piece. I'll put it up where I can see it. Representation for women has had no place in this nation's thought. Since the incorporation of the 13 original states, 24 have been admitted to the Union, not one of which has recognized women's right of self-government. 
On this birthday of our national liberties, July 4th, 1876, Colorado, like all her elder sisters, comes into the Union with the invidious word male in her constitution. <laughs> so, fast forward. Colorado comes into the Union uh, with a contested issue about women's vote, which was that they did enfranchise women for school board elections in 1876, but not for the, the political vote. And in 1877, they had a, there was a referendum on women's suffrage which failed. But by 1893, uh, things changed a bit. And uh, women of Colorado did get the vote, and this is very interesting. They got it by referendum. The legislature finally passed women's suffrage and said it could go on the ballot for the male population to vote on. And they did. And it passed by 55%. In Route County here, which was named after one of the governors who was pro-suffrage, it passed by 62%. So Route County was on the, the cutting edge here. Um, and um, this was during a time of deep depression when the, the, one of the slogans was that if the men have messed everything up, let's see what the women can do. <laughs> <laughs> and this, this was in print in a variety of places. But in fact, uh, the vote was 35,798 to 29,451. So, Let's see, where are we, are we going with this? We're going to the article in the Colorado Magazine in April 1893 by a certain Emily Kellogg, which is a big write-up about the World's Congress of Representative Women, which was being held during the Columbian, World's Columbian Exhibition in Chicago, which was the next one to take place in the US after the one in 1876. And at that, World's Columbian Exhibition, the uh, <coughs> women's movement people organized the World's Congress of Representative Women, which was what this particular article was about. And um, about that same, same time, no, actually earlier, a woman named Caroline Churchill from Denver had founded a suffragist paper, which she called, first of all, the Colorado Antelope, but it quickly changed its name to the Queen Bee. <laughs> and she was very instrumental in the, the propaganda for women's suffrage. But to, to, to turn to the World's Congress of Representative Women, which we will turn to now, this particular Congress, the first of its kind ever, and much, much touted was the first Congress to, to uh, be held during the, the Columbian Exposition. And it was a very big deal. They had women from many different countries who came, as well as women from um, <coughs> just about every state of the United States. And May Wright Sewell, you, know, you have a handout with a, far, a drawing of her, actually. This is how she looked in the 1890s. On the flip side, is how she looked at 19, 1904 at the Berlin Congress, which I'll talk about now. Oh my gosh. All gussied up. Yeah. So May Wright Sewell, who was born in 1844 and died in 1920, was a stellar contributor to the development of international feminism. This energetic and far-sighted American became a prime mover in initiating and establishing the International Council of Women, which I refer to as the ICW, mm -hmm. uh, which was founded in 1888. It was the first international women's organization, and it started out with a nucleus of, of U.S. women. Sewell was the first president of the National Council of Women of the United States, which was founded jointly. And she also served the ICW as de facto president from 1890 to 1893, during which time she organized this big congress in Chicago. Sewell then served the ICW as vice president at large during the presidency of Lady Aberdeen, who in turn organized the huge London Congress that followed in 1899. And at London Congress, the ICW delegates elected Sewell as president. 
Now, her tireless organizational work ensured that this first and most successful of the international women's organizations would ultimately endure. Both before and during her presidency, she promoted what she called the council idea by encouraging the formation of national councils and establishing topical standing committees that included one member from each national council. Now, the first three of these standing committees were peace and arbitration, laws on domestic relations, i.e. marriage laws, to do a comparative study, and the third one was the press. And that was involved in um, collecting solid, good statistics and information on women's status and then sharing those with the press and getting the word out. Now, Sewell's contribution, though, to international organizing went far beyond that of a pragmatic organizer. And um, incidentally, she was also the primary historian of the formative years of the ICW. She was above all a visionary whose thought inspired her activism as she elaborated the council idea and formulated what she called the new internationalism. Um, here I will focus on her organizational activities, but also on some of her ideas, with a particular emphasis on her articulation of this new internationalism, which was very collaborative. <coughs> it was designed to offset and challenge the extremely competitive and chauvinistic nationalism that characterized early 20th century masculine politics. Sewell's new internationalism anticipated a human harmony and spiritual unity that could mute, if not entirely dissolve, class and ethnic boundaries. In fact, her thinking encompasses all the characteristics of what we now call transnationalism. It was very bridging, it was very inclusive, and could be operated at local, regional, national, as well as international um, levels. Now, three linked points should, should be kept in mind in any evaluation of ICW and of Sewell's specific contributions. And the first was that the council, ide the council idea itself and the fact that the, the International Council chose for it, its motto the um, <clears throat> famous golden rule that you have all been familiar with, I'm sure since childhood, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. And she would sort of spin that in various directions. The second thing was the multiple agenda, multiple issue agenda. It wasn't just about suffrage, it was about many other things. And third, it was, was her assertion that, and the assertion of the ICW, that all women are working women. And I'll talk about each of these. <laughs> According to the council idea, as elaborated by Sewell, the ICW never enrolled individual members. Its objective was to launch and affiliate whole national councils consisting of already affiliated national organizations and thereby to foster a massive bulk membership that could ultimately speak publicly with an authoritative voice. Already by 1900, she had to some degree succeeded in planning the desired image. A headline in Harper's Bazaar, which wasn't strictly about fashion in those days, um, that summer proclaimed Mrs. Maywright Sewell the leader of five million women. <laughs> However, in most other countries, even when local groups existed, it took years, even decades, to develop national organizations that could affiliate to national councils. And this was particularly a problem in some of the European countries which still had laws on association that forbid any kind of organization above 20 people. Um, freedom of speech being somewhat restricted in those places as well. I mean, the United States was the world champion in organization to found schools, to found churches, to found this, to found that, to do that. And there were no restrictions here. But elsewhere in the world, uh, this kind of organization was seriously restricted. So part of her mission was to try and foster the spirit of organization to get things done. She was one of these 
really that my son-in-law would call the get-her-done chick. <laughs> um, secondly, the ICW's mission through the national councils, councils was to foster a collective women's consciousness or consensus on all the major issues of the day. In effect, a parliament of women. This was at a time, a time a grandiose, though not entirely unrealistic, objective. From its inception, the ICW had behind it the full weight of the National American Women's Suffrage Association, along with the international moral force of Susan B. Anthony, whom I'm sure you've all heard of. <laughs> uh, she, but she, Susan B. Anthony is much better known than May Wright Sewell. Mm -hmm. and it, I think it's partly because May Wright Sewell spent so much of her time abroad and working at this international level that she didn't sort of factor into the national history in the same way. Um, this plus the impetus given its development by Sewell's recruiting, the extraordinary impact of the World's Congress of Representative Women, and its unique structure and vision that to the ICW had no real rival. Now at the third point, finally, Sewell introduced into the ICW's vocabulary the unifying concept of women workers. Women workers was a deliberately inclusive term that embraced and valued all work done by women, whether paid or unpaid labor. This definition of women's work and women's workers challenged the still prevailing notion of liberal political economists who promoted the male breadwinner model and the productiveness of paid labor, and in consequence, devalued women's contributions, positing that neither women's unremunerated domestic labor nor their unremunerated volunteer labor counted in economic terms. Now, we still have some of the same problems with the liberal economists today. But the notion of women workers takes on further significance in light of another challenge to liberal political economy. Um, throughout the 1890s and into the 20th century. And that was the Second International Working Women's Association, um, which insisted that all women should be gainfully employed in order to become economically independent. And in addition, should affiliate only with socialist parties and the Second International. Mm. Women like Sewell refused to be pigeonholed as bourgeois, which was what the, the socialists were trying to, to pigeonhole them as, as distinct from socialist. In her view, women workers existed in every economic stratum, and whether or not they volunteered or were paid for their contribution was quite irrelevant. This was another approach to forming a community of women, and developing pride, actually. Women who valued their contributions to the larger society and to the world in terms that transcended conventional economic thinking. Now, this is now pretty, pretty ahead of the times. Um, so who was May Wright Sewell? She was born in the American mid Midwest, in uh, Wisconsin, actually, was largely homeschooled, and then attended the Women's College of what became Northwestern University near Chicago. Significantly, she majored in foreign languages. She was married twice, but childless, and her, threw her energies into journalism, girls' education, dress reform, controversies surrounding women's employment, philanthropic activities, and ultimately women's rights campaigns, including suffrage. Not least, in a time of global anxiety about war and empire, she turned to peace and arbitration work. She envisioned the council idea, as I mentioned, as leading to a permanent international parliament of women, which would address issues related particularly to womenhood, but and this is a quote, where all the great questions that concern humanity shall be discussed from the woman's point of view. And she was sure there was such a thing. <laughs> she was keen to enlist her European counterparts in this effort, particularly the French. In fact, Sewell, like a number of Americans in the fin de siècle, was an ardent Francophile. Thus, shortly after the founding of the ICW in 1888, Sewell set sail for France. During her second trip in 1889, she attended and spoke at the first government-endorsed feminist congress in Paris on women's work and institutions, the Oeuvre et Institutions. Um, 
Her primary contact was a woman named Isabel Beaujolais, who had attended the 1888 founding <coughs> meeting of the ICW in Washington, D.C., served as the organization's first treasurer, and continued as an active participant in its meetings, and helped to found the French National Council. Now, Sewell's brief speech at the inaugural session of the 1889 Paris Congress, and it's important to remember that 1889 was their centennial of their revolution. So it was a huge, big expo in Paris, and again, a series of these congresses, of which, again, the Women's Work and Institutions Congress was the first, and financed by the government. So there was a real seal of approval there. Um, Silsbury's speech there insisted on America's historic links to France, providing hints of her future devotion to transnational internationalism, as well as the importance of working through official channels, i.e. getting government support and money. She commented positively on the significance of the French Republican government's official recognition of the Congress, considering this a milestone for women everywhere in keeping with France's devotion to grand causes and universal principles, and a sign of a government allied to the progress of women. Quote, France has accomplished a great deal for the freedom of the human race, she remarked in her very best French. She further invoked the French government's earlier gift of the Statue of Liberty to the United States, honoring, in honor of the American Revolutionary Centennial of 1776 pointing out that, quote, France has placed the torch that will illuminate the world in the hands of a woman. <laughs> Amen. The longer version of the speech she drafted for this occasion dwelt on all the advantages to be obtained from national and international councils of women. And during this same European trip, she <coughs> Sewell visited Switzerland and went on to England to implore the distinguished English suffrage leader, Millicent Fawcett Garrett, Garrett Fawcett, should be, to accept the presidency of the ICW in which, to which she had been elected in absentia at the 1888 founding meeting. Fawcett firmly and definitively refused, pleading, quote, already enough work at home, as well as unripe conditions in England for federating the existing organizations of women. She underscored her final refusal, though, by insisting that the English and Americans had little in common. <laughs> the purposes of their societies, respective societies, being so different. To May Wright Sewell, Fawcett's refusal was highly disappointing, but it also meant that Sewell, who was still the president of the NCW of the United States, would shoulder the burden and amplify her role in developing the ICW. And uh, I want to just point out that the ICW, you have to think of it like a tech startup. Yeah, and they were sort of inventing the thing as they went. Mm -hmm. There was no firm format out there for doing this kind of thing. So it evolves enormously in the next 10 to 15 years as they encounter certain problems along the way and have to, to tweak the machine a little bit. Now, Sewell was back in Europe for extended visits in 1891 and again for three months during the summer of 1892. This time, promoting the ICW through one-on-one -on -one visits in Belgium, Germany, and France. And of course, she continued with, to recruit women to speak at this World's Congress of Representative Women. Uh, <clears throat> so she was presiding the NCW US. She was organizing the World's Congress of Representative Women, and she's running all around trying to generate national council. I mean, this is a one-woman whirlwind. And uh, I find this extremely fascinating. In addition, she was running with her husband at the girls' classical school in Indianapolis. I guess whenever she touched home base. Now, the 1893 Congress of Representative Women was like, <clears throat> as I said, in, in Paris, the first Congress to launch the Columbian Exhibition. It provided a huge stimulus to women's international organizing. The preliminary address, distributed in September 1892, reflected Sewell's expansive and optimistic mode of thinking. It envisioned women's addressing every issue affecting humanity, not the least of which 
but not the sole concern being the woman question. The Congress's general themes would include education, industry, art, philanthropy, charity, moral and social reform, religion, civil law, and government. The call clearly stipulated that in, the, in this Congress, those great subjects will be viewed from a different standpoint. The object of this Congress being to discuss not the subject per se, but the relation of women of the world to this subject. By all accounts, this week-long Congress, with its 81 sessions, enjoyed an enviable success. The domestic and foreign press gave it expansive coverage, and as I mentioned, the Colorado Magazine itself had a huge long issue with a lot of portraits of the various uh, participants. There was probably a lot more. Uh, and I've gone through here to there are a lot of quotes I can give you, but I think I want, the one I want to dwell on here <coughs> is in her closing address called The Economy of Women's Forces Through Organization. Uh, she painted in glowing terms her vision of the ICW as a republic composed of national councils and its ultimate incarnation as the parliament of women, but reiterating her insistence that it should address all these great questions concerning humanity. Ultimately, the vision encompassed something even grander, an international parliament of men and women, wherein, she said, would be legislated the questions that concern the world. So she was an internationalist of the organizational kind well before we get to the League of Nations and the United Nations. How many do I have time? Good. It's 12.30. Oh, doing fine. Okay, great. Now, during the uh, Chicago expedition, Sewell had petitioned for and staffed a combined office and hospitality suite in the women's building. I don't know if you've heard about the women's building. It was an immense structure that was pioneered by um, Bertha Honoré Palmer, Mrs. Potter Palmer, who was the chair of the Women's Commission for the Expo. And um, they required exhibits from all over the world about women's work and what they were doing. And, uh, but additionally, Sewell stayed through the entire summer when she and her husband Theodore hosted Wednesday receptions with themed presentations on international cooperation. She always also hosted a series of women-only luncheons with the purpose of encouraging transnational dialogue. Everything Sewell did that summer was in line with an eye to promoting dialogue, cooperative effort, and indisputably to realizing the council idea. Now, between uh, <clears throat> 1894 and 1899, she was equally busy. Uh, a little interlude, unfortunate interlude, was in 1895 when her husband Theodore fell ill with tuberculosis and died. So she spent the summer nursing him in Prescott, Arizona, but not without managing to organize a couple of women's clubs <laughs> in Prescott. <laughs> and giving talks around the state. Uh, she did not sit still too well. Uh, then she went to the Netherlands and visited their international exposition and so on and so forth. Um, other anticipated national council affiliates by that point included Switzerland, Belgium, Greece, Victoria, Austria, Persia, and Russia. And she continues to talk about women workers, the ICW as a confederation of workers, and the harbinger of a new civilization, and so on and so forth. But, um, it is this period that Sewell developed her most significant thinking about internationalism. And in her 1899 vice presidential speech at the London Congress, this was the next big Congress, the ICW met every five years formally, and their executive committee would meet annually in between. But around each of these quinquennial meetings, as they call them, <coughs> the host country would organize a huge, big congress around it. So this time it was London's turn, and even Millicent Garrett Foss had decided she could participate at this point. Uh, I have some great quotes here from her. <clears throat> and some of them are on the, the sheet of handout that I gave. But 
One of the things she stressed in 1899 was that each of us must en endeavor to get the other's point of view and the other nation's point of view. To my mind, we who come from countries under representative governments who boast about liberality are most emphatically called on to prove ourselves genuine exponents of the fundamental principles of representative government. And we who are accustomed to that phrase and to all it implies, she said, are more bound to make a steady effort to get the other nation's point of view than are the representatives of those countries whose peoples are under the absolute rule of unlimited monarchies, <coughs> of which there were quite a few. During the next few days, she said, I hope our conscientious effort and our facility in shifting our point of view may be illustrated in the meetings of Congress. The effort to be generous to one another and to be just to one another is implied in our having entered into the international bond. We of the Republic across the sea have found that there are two readings of democracy. We may have started out in our career as a nation with the first reading ever uppermost in the national mind. In other words, I am just as good as anyone. In the process of our evolution as a nation, we have come to a better reading. And in this better reading, the doctrine of democracy runs thus. Everyone is just as good as I. We wish the representatives of monarchies to be just to the representatives of republics. More necessary, however, is it that the rep representatives of republics shall be generous to the representatives of monarchies. Mm. Uh, so on she goes, um, meeting with the executive committees, running to some of the other international expositions in Buffalo, St. Louis, in our country, and continuing to pro promote the new internationalism. In 1899, she was elected president of the ICW, re replacing Lady Aberdeen, who was a, a, <clears throat> from a great Scottish aristocratic family. And um, in turn, Lady Aberdeen becomes her vice president. So <laughs> Lady Aberdeen is very, very involved in the ICW all along. And she's all a very down-to-earth aristocrat, a liberal, but she was also one of these get her done chicks. So between the two of them, they really had a, an interesting operation on both sides of the Atlantic and reaching out from there. And of course, Lady Aberdeen's husband <coughs> had been the, the Governor General of Canada, and during her <coughs> vice presidency, um, he was the Viceroy of Ireland. Wow. So Lady Aberdeen did a lot to bring the Irish together and do things for the cause of Irish working women, as well as organizing working women in, in Great Britain and England in particular. So the international cooperation thing continues, and I'm going to skip over some of this. But I put on your um, handout some of the longer quotations from her speeches in 18, 1904 at the Berlin Congress of the ICW. And this is, this is her at the Berlin Congress as the president. And you see she's, she's all decked out. And part of the, the reason for this costume was because, you know, the, Germany was still an empire. It still had a Kaiser. And it still had a lot of very well-placed aristocrats. It also had connections to the British royal family through the, the mother of Wilhelm II, who was Queen Victoria's daughter. And so the aristocracy was very much in evidence. And uh, May Wright Sewell and the Americans thought they needed to gussy up a little bit. So <clears throat> there's a wonderful picture of, of Sewell and uh, <clears throat> Lady Aberdeen Helena Long, who was their German secretary, and a couple of other people seated at a table, and Susan B. Anthony planted right in the middle. And she has, was continually coming to these uh, congresses, even into her high 80s. Uh, she was, <clears throat> seemed to never get sick. Um, now, during Sewell's term as president from 1899 to 2004, the fruits of her international organizing efforts re ripened. 
Nine more national councils did join the ICW, and thanks in large part to her efforts. Uh, Italy in 1900, France in 1901, Argentina in 1901, Switzerland 1903, Austria 1903, Victoria, South Australia, Norway, and Hungary in 1903 and 1904. Now you may notice Victoria, South Australia, before it was Tasmania and so forth. All these uh, crown colonies joined separately, but Australia was brought together as a state in uh, 19, the early 1900s, and so these five councils who had joined the ICW had to compress themselves into one, and they were not happy about it, <laughs> as you might expect. So that shrunk the number of uh, national councils slightly again. But in the meantime, Sewell had also succeeded in organizing the first three of the international theme committees, and one more would be added in Berlin. And that was the Committee on the White Slave Traffic, um, which was headed actually by a French woman I've written about, Jenya Aville de Saint Croix, mm. who was uh, another really lively and interesting person. And then finally, they, they added a committee on suffrage as well. By the time of the, her 1904 presidential address, Sewell reviewing the five years of her presidency would invoke the solidarity of humanity and calling on those who attended to observe the golden rule. Um, and she has a wonderful, wonderful quote, which is on your sheet, and I, I won't read it, but it starts out, I have found that there is also a real danger in the practical side of our work. I'll leave it to you to read that afterwards. But it's quite, quite moving. Um, it ends this way. <clears throat> about, uh, it must not be forgotten that this council is a democracy which includes in itself all circles of society. We are in a new world, a world of labor, where only consecrated laborers have a place and where all such are welcomed. Not only one, only no one of them more widely welcomed than the other, on account of her nationality, on account of her race, on account of her religion, on account of her social position but where only she is most welcome who will give us the best example of truth, integrity, of uprightness, of justice, and of love for humanity. It should be clear by now that when Sewell invoked internationalism, she did not mean intergovernmental. And none of these national councils were organized on a sort of local, regional, state kind of basis. They were all national organizations who themselves may have organized that way, but they came to the, the National Council and to the International in a, in a very more corporate kind of way. Now, May Wright Sewell, I think her achievement is really impressive. Her combined vision and organizational skill turned a seemingly impossible dream into reality. The ICW, International Council of Women, still exists today and has inspired daughter and granddaughter organizations. It has NGO status at the United Nations. Um, it has also indirectly inspired other later efforts to convene parliaments of women. And I'll just mention the Women's International Democratic Foundation Federation, which was founded in 1945 and became affiliated with the Communist International. Or the more recent Global Summit of Women, organized by a woman named Irene Natividad. Um, which is described as an annual gathering of women leaders from around the world. Shouldn't we be surprised that Sewell relished the challenge of such work? In 1915, she wrote retrospectively, the best joy in life is to attack the impossible. The ICW was one of those impossible dreams that became a reality, and it was unlikely to have done so without Sewell's major contribution during the crucial period in its development. Thank you. Question? Oh, okay. now, we do have time for questions. Were, were any of the nations, uh, did any of them have suffrage that were joining the ICW? Uh, the answer is that outside the United States, the first nation to give suffrage to the women was New Zealand. 
And that was 1893, the same year as the big World Women's Representative Congress. And it's called international, but was South America represented? Uh, it sounded very European. It was very European in the beginning, but as you heard, Argentina came in in 1901. Mm -hmm. It took a while to get some of the others engaged. Because there was this, this big problem about anything organizing nationally. But uh, the Latin Americans did get involved. Uh, ultimately, they had Asian uh, members, national councils, and um, councils from just about everywhere. And the current International Council of Women uh, has a lot of African councils as well. Mm -hmm. So it expanded with the possibilities. But I think what's, what fascinates me is how they managed to even pull any of this off without the facts, without the telephone until yeah, the early true. 20th century. Transatlantic ships yeah. took a couple of weeks. Yeah. Um, and the mail service worked on, and they mailed out you know, tens of thousands of brochures and letters and summons to come to these councils. I had a mind-boggling amount of paperwork. And it was a fault, you know, this is when typewriters are barely coming in. One of the interesting things that you find in the ICW archives, which are now in Brussels and Belgium, is the sort of transition from the handwritten things or the printed things to typed minutes. And, uh, and there's no carbon copies, really. So <laughs> it's, uh, you know, the a kind of work that goes into this type of organizing is just almost hard for us to fathom. Mm -hmm. And money, how did she afford all of these? How, how was she funded? That was my question. How was she that funded was a is a good question. Um, because Sewell was not a wealthy woman, um, unlike Lady Aberdeen, who had very deep pockets. <laughs> but um, Sewell raised a group of what she called the patrons, who would give a certain amount, fairly substantial amount of money, to the council. And they could come to the meetings. They couldn't vote. <laughs> <laughs> but they could be you know, recognized as being important to the cause. And apparently they came up with a number of these women. Uh, sometimes I think there were some men who served as patrons also. And that was how they did it in the beginning. Um, they then started uh, charging fees to the national councils and annual dues and that sort of thing. So eventually, but mostly they were, you know, operating on a shoestring. Yeah. Yeah. And they were, they looked big, and there's five million women, but, you know, <laughs> behind the scenes, there's a scrounging. Um, they're licking a promise. Um, along, along the lines of money, um, I know they are considering women for um, paper money for a new bill or whatever. Is she being... What, is she one of the women that's being considered? I don't know, but I think I should nominate her. <laughs> they talked about Susan B. Anthony. Mm -hmm. I think Eleanor Roosevelt may have the... Yeah. Yeah, I think Eleanor Roosevelt may have the, the bid for the, the women on the bill. There's now talk about doing a $15 yeah. bill, so you don't have to take anybody off or anything. So oh. who knows where this will all go. In yes. their policy discussions and all, uh, did they ever, um, did it ever come up um, uh, about um, possibly um, trying to liberate the Arabic uh, women and stuff, and some Muslim, attack the Muslim religion? They didn't talk about that so much in the ICW. It was talked about, though, in some of the European nations. Uh -huh. And there, there are constant references, sort of offhand, in most of the, the feminist newspapers and mm. weeklies and weeklies and so forth, they were the plight of the poor Muslim women. Yeah. On the other hand, they were you know, the plight of the poor Chinese women, too. Yeah. Um, but one of the interesting things is that, in, I think it was the, the 1893 Congress already, there was a representative from Syria, and there was another one from Palestine. Hmm. So, you know, there were people coming from these other areas. Um, and there was a, a Chinese woman who came to the 1889, 1899 Congress 
in uh, London to talk about all the good things that were happening with Chinese women and that one shouldn't think of them as all standing around with their feet bound, not able to move. <laughs> she really gave a, a very pointed lecture yeah. about this. Uh, <clears throat> so, to show that there was another whole side to things and Chinese women were doing plenty of stuff that was good. Yes, question in the back. Can you review again, please, how one was able to vote at these meetings? I'm sorry? Will you review how one was able to vote at these meetings? At the, which ones? At the ICW meetings? Sure. Yeah. Uh, the the, the patrons would come, but they couldn't say anything? The patrons could, I think, even be part of the discussion. Right. But the people who voted were the delegates from the national councils. Did she meet with presidents ever or have any? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, in fact, um, before the, the 1900 Congress in Paris, uh, she and Susan B. Anthony went to see President McKinley in the White House to ask that Sewell be appointed an official commissioner to the fair and to the, the Congresses. And she did get that letter signed by the Secretary of State. And we had that letter in the archives. So yeah, there, you know, the any National Council of the United States always met annually in Washington, D.C. And they had the, the ear of the political establishment. They were very well connected. Can you, Matt, can you mention any significant legislation that they influenced, either here in this country or elsewhere? I think over, over time, yes. I, I look at the very early period, so I'm not as familiar with what happens later, but I'm, I'm sure they do. Certainly the, the business with marriage laws was very important to them. And, you know, marriage laws at that time were state by state. Mm -hmm. As was the, the notion of political representation. Mm -hmm. Every state had the right to say who could vote or who could not vote mm -hmm. and define the conditions. And uh, so it was only, you know, there was a federal amendment that gave the vote to black men in 1864. But the women, we're still doing state by state campaigns for suffrage. There's a, a very endearing quote from Carrie Chapman Catt, who was head of the Federal Amendment Campaign Committee, about how many hundreds of campaigns the women suffrage people in the U.S. had run before they turned to the Federal Amendment solution, which finally was ratified in 1920, as you know. I don't know whether this was only in Nantucket but we used to go there in the summer when we lived in Massachusetts, mm -hmm. and they had freehold. If you were not a freeholder, which meant you had paid off your mortgage or you didn't have a mortgage, you couldn't vote, but only men could own property. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that was a real, mm -hmm. real situation. Mm -hmm. Which is why one of the, the earliest Participants in the, the women's rights movement were from Nantucket. <laughs> Surprise? <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. But they were a hotbed of revolution when we were there one year because they tried to put, give one vote instead of two votes to the islands. So, um, you know, they hmm. got together and they were going to leave Massachusetts and go with Rhode Island or <laughs> Connecticut, whoever would want them, <laughs> because they were an island. So <laughs> it was very interesting. Yeah, yeah and Nantucket's really, yeah. really You know, and they were wearing tea bags, like, you know, yeah. they had taxation without representation. It was a real tea wow. party. <laughs> Which year was this? Um, probably, we're here 21 years. I would say at least 30 years ago that uh -huh. they were doing this. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. They were sort of disenfranchised, they uh -huh. thought, uh -huh. in the islands. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, one of you had asked about the when did the various countries give women the vote, and I mentioned New Zealand in 1893. Yeah. But the first one in Europe was Finland, which was in oh. 1906. Mm -hmm. Well, that was even after this balloon Congress. Mm. 
there any, oh, I had two questions, but I've changed to this one now. Um, <laughs> when you mentioned Finland, you mentioned New Zealand. Is there any overlay um, because of religious traditions in countries and women's openness to join this dialogue? Um, because I think of Finland, I think of maybe a little bit I know about New Zealand versus some very, very strong, um, and, and I don't mean this is a criticism, but like difficulties you'll have in um, countries that are very, very traditional Catholic with lots of families, yeah. lots of children. I think of Guatemala as, an, in, in, as a situation. Mm -hmm. So was there any of that that occurred based on religious traditions or strength, numbers and strengths in countries that made them it's more or less open to the idea? It's very clear in the early phases of this international organization that it's the women in the Protestant countries who are yeah. leading the charge. Which seemed to be what you were saying. Yeah. yeah, now that changes to some degree after I think Benedict the Thirteenth, I think, decided that women's suffrage was okay. That was in 1919. And after that, the Catholic women really started organizing. Um, and that, that's another whole long story. They refused to join the, the International Council of Women. They founded their own group called St. Joan's International Alliance. Uh -huh. And that was, had similar types of delegates from different countries. But they sort of stood apart. The other group that was very involved in this early phase were the Jewish women. So it's really the Protestant women and the Jewish women who were leading the charge. And there was a big fuss about, at one particular meeting, I think it was the, the one in, when they were planning the young 1904 Congress, and the, the Americans had the custom of having a, a prayer before the opening of each meeting. And that was finally changed to the president's message because the Germans objected to having this, this prayer at the beginning of the service. They said it gives it too much of a religious flavor and we don't want that. So things, as I say, there are little controversies all the way along. That was one of them. But yeah, you're absolutely right about the Catholic part. They eventually, I think they do eventually come on board. But um, I don't know about that part very much. Mm -hmm. Anybody in the back? Mm -hmm. Well, if not, yeah. thank you very much for coming. Yeah. I appreciate it.